Hello, today I'd like to talk through a retrosynthesis of this small organic molecule on the right um, and also a plan for its forward synthesis. Um, the pitch of this uh, video is going to be at the level of somewhere in the middle of an undergraduate degree course in chemistry, um, so some familiarity with organic mechanisms and reagents will be expected, but not very much on the level of uh, retrosynthetic planning. If you'd like to see more videos along the style of this one uh, on various different topics in chemistry, please do subscribe to my channel and let me know what sorts of things you would like me to talk about. Okay then, as with any retrosynthesis plan that you want to go for, um, we might want to have a quick scan on our molecule to see what functional groups we have and what we're having to deal with. Um, so I'm just going to label a few of them here. Over on this side of the molecule, I've got a secondary amide. Um, I should also note that in the middle of the molecule I've got a 1,4 benzene. And I've also got this thiol functional group here. So there's three key functional groups in this molecule. So just having a think about what uh, we know that these types of functional groups can do and the sorts of chemistry they normally participate in. The secondary amides, generally in the grand scheme of things, um, they're pretty stable as a functional group benzene ring in the middle. They're also notoriously pretty stable. They're not very reactive to many sets of conditions. So we can label that as well as pretty stable. The thiol, however, we might want to think about a bit differently. I can label that as a reactive functional group. It's reactive in the sense that it's got an acidic proton. But also it could be reactive in the sense that it's got a, a nucleophilic, like a good nucleophilic sulfur lone pair. So this gives me a clue of where I want to start thinking about starting my retrosynthesis. This is a big flag here that I should be disconnecting first. And if I disconnect the thiol first, that means I don't have to carry it through many steps in my forward synthesis. Okay, so having a think about what types of reactions I need to use to install a thiol, uh, a sulfur in that oxidation level, um, generally we would use nucleophilic type chemistry, so I'm going to take us back to um, an alkyl halide as a leading group. And that's because there's a pretty robust method of turning um, carbon leading groups into um, thiols by using a reagent known as thiourea uh, and then following it up with a alkaline workup. And I'll go through the mechanism of that later on in the video. Okay, unfortunately the, the um, alkyl bromide is itself a reactive functional group, so we should disconnect that straight away. Um, that'll take me back to an alcohol. And I could use an, any number of reagents to convert an alcohol into a bromide, but one of the more, most classic ones is PBr3. It should work well in that situation. Okay, so now I've got an alcohol and an amide and a benzene. All the groups are reasonably stable, so we can think about making some strategic cuts for our synthesis um, in our disconnections. So one of the things we might want to do is try to break the molecule somewhere in the middle so that we separate ourselves into two halves. That will increase the convergency of the forward synthesis when we start to piece everything together. So I'm going to focus in on um, either side of the benzene, which is the central functional group here. There's a CC connection to the benzene, or there's a CN connection to the benzene, both of which there are methods uh, for making those types of bonds. Um, but I'm also going to take a clue that there's a, a nearby oxygenation over here. So the types of reactions we might want to think about that can do carbon-carbon uh, bond formation for benzene rings would include Friedel Crafts type chemistry, and particularly uh, Friedel Crafts acylation would give us something very close to the, the pattern that we have in our molecule. So uh, I'm going to do a quick functional group into conversion to help steer me towards a Friedel Crafts disconnection. So I'm going to turn that alcohol into a ketone.
and I just double check while I'm doing this that I could go backwards in my forward synthesis. So having a think about what my backwards reaction would be, I need something that can convert my ketone into an alcohol, but also not touch this um, other carbonyl group that's down here. So a sensible um, reagent for this would be something like sodium borohydride as a nucleophilic reducing agent. Okay, moving on, this is now the perfect setup for a friedel crafts type disconnection. So this is friedel crafts That'll take me back to butanol chloride, which is good because this is cheap and readily available, um, and another amide on this side. So for that friedel crafts step, we just need to check that we will get the correct uh, correct um, reactivity pattern here. So having a look at our substrate, we've got a nitrogen lone pair on the as a part of the substitution on that benzene, which is a good pi electron donating group. And a pi electron donating group in a friedel crafts reaction. So this will be ortho para directing and activating. So this is all the good things to get a good reaction um, to do in the lab here. So we're stacking things in our favour. Um, we're probably more likely to get the para substituted product in this situation because the substituent is quite bulky, so that should disfavour some of the auto substitution product. Okay, we no now need to think about disconnecting this, and it's just an amide, so a standard way of disconnecting an amide would be to cut across the middle there, and that will take me back to um, this amine, um, which is attached to the benzene. This is uh, cheap and readily available. This is called aniline. And the other reagent that I need will be this isobutyl chloride, which is also readily available. Okay, so just to check that we've got a, a rough plan to go backwards um, at this uh, final step, if I add that uh, aniline to the isobutyl chloride, um, I will generate HCl in that reaction, so I'm going to need a base in there. And a good choice of base for this type of reaction is pyridine because it can also act as a nucleophilic catalyst for the anodation reaction, so just to make things work smoothly in the lab for us. Um, Freed of Crafts isolation, uh, we should get the para substituted product. We're going to need uh, a Lewis acid to make the acyllium ion that's a reactive enough intermediate to react with the benzene ring, so something like AlCl3 would be appropriate here. Sodium borohydride should work for that top step. PBR3 to go back to the bromide and thiourea and an alkaline workup will finish this reaction for us. Okay, so that seems like a sensible plan uh, for a disconnection to back to cheap and readily available starting materials. Next, I'm going to have a think about the mechanisms that are involved in some of these transformations in our synthesis, and specifically, I want to have a look at the ones here in the thiourea step and here in the PBR3 step. These are both nucleophilic types of chemistry um, and I'm going to start by looking at the uh, formation of the alcohol bromide. So just in this box down here if I have the alcohol I'm going to use PBr3 to synthesize the um, alcohol bromide over here. So we have to have a think about what, what, what do you think PBr3 looks like. So PBr3 is a molecule that looks like this looks like it's quite electrophilic at that phosphorus, those are electronegative bromine atoms on there. So the bromides could be acting as leaving groups on that system, for example. There's a phosphorus lone pair in the middle, which could be a good soft nucleophile. But there's nothing for the phosphorus um, lone pair to attack on the, um, on the alcohol. So we're stuck with the bromines being leaving groups. So we can use the oxygen lone pair to attack the phosphorus and kick out a bromine. And this is just a, a, a normal SN2 type process. That will give us a positive charge on the oxygen because it's lost some electron density in this reaction and it will kick off a Br minus. Now that proton is looking pretty acidic to me, so I think that will probably be dissociated in solution um, to have this intermediate around. The Br minus is still there and there's an H plus in solution. And once we've got this intermediate, the bromine itself can now be a, the bromide can be a nucleophile. Um, we could draw this re next reaction like this, where it kicks off the 
the oxygen leaving group, but that doesn't really represent what's been going on with adding the PBr3 reagent. So the PBr3 reagent was to make the oxygen a really good leaving group to compensate for the fact that there's a strong carbon-oxygen bond involved that we need to break. So perhaps a better way of representing this reaction is to draw something like this, where the, um, the bromide kicks in, forms a phosphorus oxygen double bond, and all in the same step we also use another uh, bromide as well. So that takes me all the way back to here, it's an SMT, and we'll also generate a phosphorus oxygen double bond, that's HBr, out of this process. So just having a look at the reaction overall, um, this product is a good um, enthalpy driving force for the process because we formed a very strong uh, bond in the process. And if we have a look about what we're trying to do here, this is this is totally necessary for this process because we've got a strong carbon oxygen bond over here being swapped for a much weaker carbon bromine bond on the right hand side. So we're okay in doing that provided we pay for it somewhere and this is where we can pay for it by forming a strong bond at the same time in this process. Think about the uh, fire urea step. So just coming down a little bit further. Um, we're going to use the alkyl bromide that we've just made and we're going to react it with first step, fire urea, second step, sodium hydroxide and that will generate the file product. So first we need to know what fire urea actually is. So fire urea is this structure which has got a carbon sulfur double bond and an H2 and H2. So the alkyl halide, um, we should suspect that that's probably a, um, a good electrophile and the fire urea itself is a good nucleophile. It's got both sulfur and nitrogen lone pairs. Um, and it's soft nucleophile at the sulfur, so we can do a reaction like this. The nitrogen lone pairs are delocalized into a pi system um, and are perhaps best not uh, used in, the, in a mechanism. We could draw a mechanism like this to reflect reaction at the sulfur, um, but that's just the resonance structure of the one I was drawing before anyway, so I'm just going to keep the simpler um, structure here, which emphasizes the fact that the sulfur itself is the better soft nucleophile for the SMT process here. Okay, so um, once we've done the SN2 reaction here, we're going to end up with this as the product that has the sulfur attached like this, an H2, an H2, and a plus. And this is a key intermediate in this synthesis because all of this stuff over here is to prevent multiple alkylation reactions happening at the sulfur center, which might be a risk if we use other types of sulfur nucleophiles in here. At this stage, we're gonna add sodium hydroxide. That's a good hard nucleophile, um, and that will attach here, a good hard activated electrophilic center um, to give us a quite crowded tetrahedral intermediate, H2 and H2. And this will be prone to collapse. Um, the sulfur is a really good place to put a negative charge. It's got a big diffuse orbitals um, that you can put negative charge onto. So this, this intermediate could collapse down um, like this to kick out the sulfur as a leaving group. That will give me Rs minus. And we sort of note here that we're almost really good. If this can find a proton, we've got what we need. So just having a look what the, the other product that's formed from here is, we've got a carbon oxygen double bond this time with an NH2, NH2 and a proton. So that looks like a, an acidic proton for us to take here um, to give us our other product of this reaction. And this other product is urea. So we've got a similar idea to what we had going on with our phosphorus oxygen double bond up here. Um, in this next reaction, um, we're swapping essentially a carbon sulfur double bond for a carbon oxygen double bond. The urea is a very, very stable molecule in itself. It's very well conjugated. Um, there is another delta H driving force up for this reaction. And overall, we're basically saying that we're weighing up a carbon sulfur 
double bond versus a carbon oxygen double bond and a carbon sulfur double bond may be less familiar but it's got a third row element bonded to a second row element so the pi overlapping that double bond is going to be not particularly efficient so it's nowhere near as strong as a, a really quite strong carbon ion for this formula okay and just to summarize the whole synthesis there um, we started off with um, aniline this is substituted uh, benzene ring um, we reacted the aniline with isobutyl chloride in the presence of pyridine and that will help us form an amide the amide itself is um, well set up to do a directed friedel crafts oxidation so that will be using the butanol chloride in the presence of AlCl3 that will form the acylium ion, the reactive intermediate for the Friedel Crafts acylation reaction. That will give me the ketone in the power position. Once I've got that um, ketone in there, we reduced using sodium borohydride, and that took us to the alcohol, and then we turned the alcohol into a bromide by using PBr3. And then in a final transformation to get us to our product, um, we reacted this with biourea and worked out with sodium hydroxide uh, to swap out my bromide into the bile that we wanted as our final product. So one thing to note here is that this amide was installed right at the start and has stayed all the way through the synthesis um, pretty much untouched. So that completes the forward synthesis um, that we were intending to do. Okay then, I hope you found the video interesting. If you'd like to hear about other chemistry topics talked about in a casual style, please do consider subscribing to my channel to let you know when new videos drop.